So we have with us a Sean O'Sullivan, and uh, first I'll give you all a little background on the, on the Khan Academy connection. Uh, yeah, so about three years ago, we get an email from you saying that you wanted to help us. And we're like, I, okay. And, and so you show up and then you, you know, we spent a, a more, it was at 277 Castro. I think we were probably, what, a five person organization then? Maybe, maybe, maybe three person organization at the time. Uh, you spend a half an hour with, uh, not a half a day with uh, me and Shatnu and uh, you leave essentially uh, one of our biggest supporters ever. Uh, so, you know, thank you. And that was a big vote of confidence in what we've done. And it was, at a, you know, it's, it was a phase of the organization where, you know, we didn't know what it would become and, and all the rest. So that was a, you know, we... Well, I, I mean, you were already so far down the road. It was obvious that uh, you were on to great things. And uh, here, look at the team you've got around you. You've built a, an amazing uh, set of products and capabilities and affecting many millions of people's lives. It's something that uh, anyone is lucky, uh, whether you're working here or supporting Khan, you know, you're lucky to be a part of such a, a great social movement for, no. for good. Yeah, no, I, I, I knock on wood every morning. <laughs> is. So, so let me introduce everyone to you. So you have, you know, there, there are actually several claims to fame that I knew about you before, but then this morning I started doing some research about you and you have lived a full life. So uh, I guess right now you're most famous, especially in Ireland, for being on the on Dragon's Den, which is essentially like the, the shark tank of Ireland. Yep, that's right. You're, the you're one of, of these. It's, a third, it's a, actually the third most popular show in Ireland after like the Late Late Show and the news. So it's super, like nobody really knows the Shark Tank here, but uh, you know, it's, I don't know, it's probably the 50th or 100th most popular show in, in, in America, oh. I don't know. But in Ireland, you know, I can't walk down the street without people, uh, you know, uh, giving you a bit Or giving you a business plan <laughs> yeah, exactly. or, and you have to be. All that. I, I like, and it's one of these premises where it's a bunch of investors and they have to pitch and you'll all have like money on your coffee table. And yes, yeah. that's the one. That's the show. <laughs> and we have some footage of it. Who is prepared to enter the dragon's den? Inside could be the money to turn business dreams into reality. But only the bravest and the best can tame the dragons who guard the prize. Those dragons are five of the country's most wealthy and successful business people. And the budding entrepreneurs who dare to face them in the den need to convince them to invest in their dreams. The dragons all know what it takes to be successful in the fiercely competitive world of business, having built their companies the hard way. Technology pioneer Sean O'Sullivan runs Avego, a world-leading transportation software company headquartered in Cork and operating globally while investing millions in startup businesses. My vision is to mix style and fashion with wonderful music engineering, and this is it. It's called IG Guitars. The electric guitar industry has been dominated by products which have not been innovative for 50 years. I'm conscious of style, I like to wear clothes that represent what I stand for and so do all my generation. This is what they want. It's new, it's cool, it's highly functional and they will love it. I am doing for guitars what Steve Jobs has done for phones. You know one of my fellow Dragons was uh, in a rock band, a uh, rock star with an old recording studios okay. as well. So EDL. he was only the piano player. <laughs> Janet yeah. speaks French. Uh, if you Google it, it, was big in the fifties. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> before I was born. Yeah, but uh, not before <laughs> Gavin was born. No. <laughs> What's the market for guitars? How many sell a year? Yeah, so uh, uh, like this is approximately between the states and Europe. You've got about a million electric guitars per year. What uh, is the revenues that you're projecting? Um, I'm aiming to sell 2,000 guitars in the first year at 160 euros per guitar. So that's working out at 320,000. I wanted to retail at 349, but okay. I want to bring that back to 299 after, you know, I'm getting more efficient with production and stuff like okay. that. Rob, I think you're potentially a really great entrepreneur. And I think you're probably going to need more money to to do this than the 35,000. So I'd like to give you a little more money than you asked for and take okay. a little more equity than you asked for. So okay. uh, I'd propose to give you 50,000 euro for 25% equity in your okay. company. Also, 
we have a hardware accelerator program in China that, that takes uh, designers like yourself from anywhere around the world, puts them in, in situ in, in the environment. We can put you into a program like that and get you working directly with the factories and oh, getting that more would be electronics. Absolutely awesome. Uh, so th these are all things that I'd love to work with you on, on future uh, generations of products. Um, you know, if I was working with you, um, I'd really like to work with you. But 25%, um, would you do anything where you compare that back, you know, if we hit targets to 20%? Um, if you sell 2,000 guita guitars in the first year, I'll give up from 25 and down to 20%. Okay, yeah? cool. Yeah, done deal. Great. Congratulations. A Thanks deal and a last minute reduction in equity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that's worth getting out of bed for. Take it easy. Woo <laughs> Take care. Good luck. Was it him you were looking at? Oh, yeah. Because I didn't see the differentiation in the product, really, at least oh, predicted. No, the, the product is. I mean, no, the product's the good. The product yeah. is different. It's absolutely different. Sean, that, that sales model that he's going to sell it to pay as much as you think you feel the guitar is worth, I think that'll work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, that's it. So that's Rob O'Reilly. <laughs> and that deal closed, and Rob has actually since come out with some uh, a second generation of products. And so it worked yeah. out well? Oh, yeah, is, it worked out. Yeah. This is like it's, a real thing, because oh, you yeah. see this on TV shows, you don't think... Yeah, no, it's actually a lot of times, half the time, the, the yeah. deal doesn't uh, go through, even after it seems like it goes through. In my case, probably they go through around 80, 85% of the time, but some, some of the other dragons or sharks don't actually, you know, they, they don't come to terms at, at the end. And so this is actually a, a venture that you're, you're still working on and, yeah, and the, still the, the, is... You know, it's, it's, they're producing, you know, it's got some rave uh, reviews. It's very unusual guitar. Uh, it has several unique features uh, that, uh, you know, it has a MIDI output uh, oh, as yeah. well as the sound output it has. You know, it's cut out in the center. It has a balanced beam. It's got plectrum. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a nicely designed guitar. Yes, so and we'll, we'll talk about it because, as we'll see, that is part of your your past. This oh, is the yes. music industry. Yes, which that's a we'll, we'll, invest we'll, in what you know. Exactly. So so we'll we'll start at the beginning because I mean, obviously, it's an interesting life so far. You you've had you you were born in New York. Yeah. You're you're of New Irish City. descent. Yeah. New York City, Irish descent. You eventually end, end up back in Ireland, but how did it start? I was, I was reading about, I mean, you were one of nine children? Yes, I was one of nine children. So um, I was born in New York City. I actually had a, uh, uh, you know, a deadbeat dad, actually. So we, uh, that's, uh, the, my mother and my father got separated uh, when I was three, and we were raised uh, in poverty in upstate New York uh, on the welfare system. And uh, so for, uh, for five or six years, my mom was raising the nine kids who were all under the age of 10. I was uh, three. Um, nine but, kids under the age of 10. Yeah, at, at, at one point. But then we got older. And after, uh, after uh, you know, six or seven years of that, she was able to get a job and, and uh, you know, we sort of worked our, way out of, worked our way out of poverty over the years. But that was the that was the start of it. You know, it's New York State is not a great place to be uh, growing up poor because the weather is actually quite severe compared to California. So, you know, it could be you know with wind chill or whatever minus forty degrees. And so when we would uh, go to sleep at night, uh, you know, in the dead of winter, uh, we'd gather in one room with a wood stove with the wood that we cut down from trees ourselves uh, and uh, uh, just try to you know. All of us, uh, you know, some sometimes a couple of people in one bed, uh, just the six or seven uh, people say in in uh, one room sleeping with a wood stove. Yeah, it's, and, it's probably different than how you grew up, uh, but maybe not. <laughs> it wasn't that bad actually. Uh, and, and, and I mean, and how did you, you know, given that start, which is you know, it's a hard beginning. Um, how did you get into? Uh, I mean, technology. How did you get into computers? Which was your, kind of your first passion, or one of your first passions? Is that music? Yeah. So my first passion probably w would have been computers. Mm -hmm. uh, I somehow saw my older brother went to college, and he. This was back in the day when they still had punch cards, and, and I saw some, you know, some printouts of, of work that he was doing uh, as a computer science uh, program uh, himself, and um, so I said, "Wow, I really." 
I really, it, it was just fascinating. It was really appealing to me. You know, when you are, are grow up poor, you don't have that much control over your environment. And to actually be able to control a computer is an incredibly powerful thing. You know, it does whatever you tell it to do, you know. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really remarkable. So it, it was a way of getting some control over uh, the situation and being able to develop myself um, and support myself. And, and you even support, uh, even when you were in high school? Or you yeah, 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 actually uh, my first professional job programming was when I was 14. So I uh, had learned some programming and uh, there was, for the, in America, for the poorest of the poor, there's a program uh, called the Civilian Employment Training Act. I'm not sure if it's still around, uh, but they basically give you jobs uh, that uh, are supposed to prepare you for a long time career. So uh, they uh, gave me a job being a janitor in my high school. Um, and I, I said, well, geez, that's not the greatest uh, career potential. Uh, and I don't understand why it's a training act if I don't really need that much training uh, to push a broom around or a vacuum cleaner or whatever in the, in the first place. But I found a, uh, a county uh, a agency that was you know, a couple miles from my house. And so I, I uh, asked the person who ran that agency if I could just have a job basically changing data tapes or you know, printing out things just to, just to get uh, started. And, and then he, when he discovered I could program, and I could program better than several of the other uh, you know, uh, programmers uh, that were older uh, you know, professionals, that uh, I ended up getting started that way. Wow, wow, I, I didn't even appreciate it. I mean, this wasn't that long ago. This was like the early 80s? This is the, yeah, it's early 80s. Early 80s that they would recommend for a 14-year-old to be the janitor at his yeah, own it's high school. Like, it's better than nothing, because yeah. you still get to, you know, it's a minimum wage job, but you still get some, Work. you're working, and yeah. you're contributing to your family's, you know, um, you know, your family's situation. So it's not a terrible program, it, although, you know, they're, they're obviously, they, they could have aimed a little higher than uh, janitor. So I did work as a janitor and as a, as a uh, um, you know, uh, groundskeeper and things like that for maybe a, a year before I'd found uh, a way to get myself out of it. And, and that, I mean, obviously you got that, that job and you kept developing it and you, you go to Rensselaer. Yeah, so I, I, I uh, yeah, I got into Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, which is in Troy, New York, the oldest English-speaking uh, engineering school in the world, um, uh, continuously running or whatever. The, 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 the claim to fame is the, the uh, inventor of the television, the inventor of the semiconductor uh, process, the first microprocessor, and all these other, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge, all those other uh, sort of things. And, and as a, I had been, I grew up like an hour southwest of there, so I was always hearing about, you know, how they were in the Mars Lover, Rover project and all this when I was growing up. And I just said, wow, that just sounds like the kind of thing I want to do, do really impactful, you know, amazing things. So that's what got me into engineering. Um, and I've never looked back. You know, I think that engineers have a disproportionate power um, in the planet to affect the world for, for in, in massive ways. So, you know, I, I, you know, we were just talking about this a little earlier, um, that a lot of the brightest students, unfortunately, choose to, to major in areas which are basically service industries, like one-to-one -one service industries, like the brightest kids in high school sometimes end up choosing to become doctors or lawyers. And those are things that are one-to-one -one service industries versus becoming an engineer, where you have the you know, capability to affect you know, millions or billions of people's lives with products that you design and impacts that you have on the planet, which I've also been lucky uh, to, to have been able to have been part of teams and leading teams that have had those kinds of changes over the years. And, and that's you know, your first experience coming out of college, and especially growing up poor. Um, I, it, it, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, my background wasn't as, as dire as yours, but it, it, not, not that different as well. But it, it, you know, one of the things when you come out of college is that fear of, well, do, you know, do I be an entrepreneur and kind of risk it all, or do I at least just go for the middle class, you know, pay the bills, get a car? You went, you went entrepreneurial. Uh, you, yeah, from the beginning days, like, I mean, that, you know, it, it's it's really easy to go like, you know, living like a from living like a college student where you don't have any money, you don't, you know, don't have any possessions or whatever, 
to like living like an entrepreneur, which is same exact. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you haven't That's changed same. anything. Yeah. Uh, you don't have any money. You're, you're, you know, you don't have any needs or things that would prevent you from from doing it. So I was lucky enough. I had worked my way through college, you know, uh, you know, for IBM and a couple of other uh, smaller uh, tech companies while uh, during summers and whatnot. So I was able to know that I also I also knew before I graduated college that I didn't really want to work for a, a large company because I saw like you know IBM's a great company and everything but I saw some of the best engineers uh, that I was working with in Research Triangle Park at one point North Carolina um, that they 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 were working on this video phone project back in 1984 or something and uh, and then IBM the company bought Rome ROHM which is a key systems yeah. phone provider for like a billion dollars and so this team of super dedicated engineers that have been working like eight years on this amazing product just got X'd off because of some big corporate decision that had been made 10 levels above them and they'd worked their bones off to produce this unbelievable uh, you know uh, you know break break groundbreaking product and it never saw the light of day and I said you know I'd, I'd rather not have that happen to me I'd rather be working in a smaller environment where I can have a lot more control over my destiny and so that's why I chose to start a company that's why I think it's always great to work in, in, in smaller organizations that do have big big impact like 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 you have here at Khan Academy yeah and, and that first it was map info this was uh, I mean you you it was kind of a pioneering company you know now everything you know Google Maps and you have all of these you know yeah so if you've ever has anyone ever done this has anyone ever typed an address into a computer and seen a street map Could you, can I see a show of hands if anyone's done that before so we invented that you know um, and that was a long long time ago uh, because I'm like, I'm approaching 50 like, you know, a bullet train to, to that wall over there, you know, before you could say Oompa Loompa, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be 50 years old. So, um, I, like, it was a long, long time ago, it was 30 years ago, uh, that we, we did this. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was a big idea back then and, and it pioneered and set the groundwork for all the technology that has since developed from it. Um, you know, I have a total huge respect for what, you know, that G Google's, um, you know, that, that street, uh, street view yeah. thing and, and whatnot. They've really, uh, you know, a lot of companies have done a lot uh, with the technology. But we, we, we pioneered it. The first million or so people that used street mapping on computers were, were uh, you know, 99% of them were using MapInfo. It became a couple hundred million dollar company, became a public company. Uh, it was licensed by a lot of the bigger companies to, to, to do it, but more importantly, you know, the thousands of resellers and the thousands of local countries that were using our product digitized all the street maps using our product or, or made it available to their customers using our product, which sort of set the groundwork for all the mapping that, that, that happens today, you know, so it's pretty cool. And that was, that, so that was my first company. I was there for seven years. And I was the president and uh, chairman of it uh, for for then, and then I then I left. And you let you know it goes public, and you leave, and you know the classic Silicon Valley thing is oh you know I've had one exit, let me go do my next one, or let me become a partner at a VC firm, or uh, yeah, you start a rock band. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was that was it unconventional choice. I think I've made, I've made several unconventional choices. Since. I was listening earlier this morning to Love is Pain. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's from our first, uh, first uh, EP, five song EP. Um, uh, some some uh, you know, copyright violators put it up onto the internet. Which you were happy about. I was, it was funny because I saw it. it was, <laughs> the, the name of the band was uh, Janet Speaks French. Janet Speaks French. Janet yeah. Speaks French. Uh, you actually were got, I mean, you got on the radio. Yeah, you we got, were, like, we a were real... top 40 in like, you know, 80 radio stations. Or top 40? Like yeah, yeah. And we were, uh, but you know, 80 radio stations in the United States is like, there's 2,800 radio stations yeah. or whatever. So it's like, no, none of you would have heard it. Uh, if you were even alive back in uh, 1994, or whenever it was. Oh, I was there in 1994. Yeah, you were alive? Yeah, yeah, I was alive. <laughs> I, was, I was going through high school. The, uh, and, and, and I mean, and, and that, I mean, what was going through your mind? I, obviously, music was a love of yours. You, you had, I, you know, you, I guess you were comfortable at this point financially. 
Actually, I wasn't quite comfortable at that point because the, the company was in the registration process, but it hadn't actually gone public at that point. So, oh, wow. Um, so for a while, I was just doing it. Uh, and, you know, that was all right. Like, I, I, I don't live, like, in a really uh, extravagant way. I don't need that much money because, you know, it, it always, uh, you know, it's a good grounding to remember where you came from because you could be right back there yeah. anytime. You know, uh, you never know what was uh, in front of, of you, but uh, uh, yeah. So I, I've never needed that much to to get by. So being a struggling rock musician wasn't a, that big of an adjustment uh, for and, me. And, and you do that for how many years? Are you two years actually? Two years. And then I started a, a technology company, an internet company. It was 1995 or something, uh, end of 1995, and so that was back when. Netscape uh, wasn't called Netscape. It was called Mosaic Communications, and probably none of you even heard of Netscape uh, even. But no, we're, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're, you guys you are know, we, we, hire, we, we hire people older than sixteen. <laughs> okay, <program>. good. Yeah. <laughs> I forget who I'm talking to. An engineering crowd. How many of you are engineers uh, out there? A handful, kind of, oh, half, a little bit. Used to oh, be. Very good. Sounded. That's very good. So, um, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, uh, and we came up with this concepts of you know network services over the internet and software for inside the internet uh, which we then called cloud computing you know so we came up with that term I co-coined that term myself and George Favaloro from compact computer uh, yeah, we should take pause there yeah coined cloud computing yeah That's oh, so there you go yeah, yeah. for what's worth <laughs> yeah um, and and um, love is pain and <laughs> it's not my favorite song, yeah. actually. Oh, but, no. uh, yeah, so you'd have to probably go to the second album okay. before right. you hit my favorites. But there's, um, what's, what's good on that album? It Isn't Love, that's probably my it favorite It Isn't Love. That. You were going through some, some, some hard times. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was not popular with like ladies. <laughs> was, yeah. <laughs> you could, anyway, well, our next couple yeah, of gatherings, yeah, we'll have a little bit yeah, of that. Yeah, we could uh, talk about that offline. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, and, and so you start the next company, and 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 that was another. Uh, the next was well, so, so uh, that was called Netcentric. Netcentric, um, and then and and that grew to like say ten million in sales. It yeah. wasn't a wasn't a huge thing, um, and it got sold off basically in pieces to yeah. Cisco uh, or somebody else. I can't even remember. It's like I blocked that whole part of my. It wasn't a. It wasn't the a, late 90s. It wasn't a great success that, at all. I mean, the inv investors like myself, I invested in yeah. it didn't make their money back on it. So it's a, it's a lesson in life. And then it was in, and maybe I'm skipping, but this is, I found this fascinating. I didn't know about this. I mean, we've known each other for three years, but I didn't know this whole chapter in your life. You then go to Iraq. No, actually, uh, then I became a filmmaker. Then you became a, oh yeah, you went yeah, to yeah, film yeah, school. Yeah. You became a filmmaker. Yeah, so I went to uh, USC film school uh, in, in LA, um, which is awesome. And uh, I was making films. I made a, you know, like a hundred films in five years. Uh, but Sounds like me. I just kind of. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but like <laughs> here's a rhyme better. Well, like they're little, little, yeah. like three-minute videos and you know, music videos and you know, lots of other things like that. But I was looking for a project, um, and the Iraq War was about to start in two thousand and three you know, 2003 yeah yeah so yeah so it was March of 2003 when I finally I was started working on trying to get into Iraq get permission to get into Iraq in uh, the end of 2002 um, while it because you of, saw the war was coming the, the drum beats, beats were going yeah, and yeah, there were yeah. all these protests all over you know New York LA yeah. I went and filmed all that and then I got myself in with a peace activist group called the Christian peacemaking team which just uh, I was just going to be documenting their uh, their struggles, and they were allowed into Iraq under the Saddam regime, and so I went in there, and uh, it was I was in Iraq when the you know when uh, in Baghdad when uh, what was it called Shank and Awe, uh, yeah. you know uh, yeah. began, and it was actually quite an amazing time uh, to be there and to see it both both pre and post. But as a filmmaker, you know, I, I also, you know, uh, as you do, is when you go into um, dictatorian regimes, they, they have um, followers called, um, oh geez, I'm forgetting everything. Uh, minders, yeah, but the minders, yeah. Oh yeah, that's what they're called, uh, yeah, minders, thank you very much. They, so they have government, like the inf inf industry of information, or, uh, 
I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting what, the, uh, what the name of the Ministry of Information was. But anyway, the Ministry of Information uh, uh, said, would attach a minder to you to make sure you didn't t take photos of anything that you're not supposed to take photos of. Because they only want to, they will take you to a place where, you know, maybe a, a bomb went, went wrong or they, they, they claim a bomb went the wrong way or they'll take you to hospitals and show you pictures of women and children, but they won't actually let you photograph anything else. So, uh, so I was ejected from the country because I've never taken very well to, to rule, rules. So, yes. um, and so that's where I met my wife, actually. She was, uh, she was just also a rule breaker. She was, uh, she was uh, arrested by the Syrians when she was trying to cross the r uh, river into Iraq, you know, illegally uh, storm storming in. Uh, so, so uh, but she was in Jordan. And then, then when, the wall, or when uh, Baghdad fell, um, the, 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 the border fell and we were able to go uh, back into the country and so I was there for the next 18 months or so. Wow. No, I mean, this is like, you can make a movie. I, I'm already imagining the, the casting for, you know, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that's, you're a movie <laughs> maker. cast is me. Yeah, well, I'll think about that. I'll think <laughs> of, uh, I have some ideas, but I'll tell you off. The, uh, and, and so then, and then you go back into, I mean, this is, that's kind of, and, and I was even reading, I mean, one of your partners in this, God. Yeah, Mohamed Al Safar probably is that what you're referring yeah. to. Yeah. So I started. I worked a little bit for CNN and Reuters, and just doing a lot of freelance uh, work at that point. Um, and then uh, after a while, I got fed up with uh, the U.S. Uh, government's ability to execute. You know, they were just really in a. You know, they couldn't get anything done. It didn't seem so. Uh, so I started a humanitarian organization called Jumpstart International. And we went in and we cleaned up a whole bunch of, uh, we, we employed 3,500 people in the end. It started with just myself and 30 guys and then we grew it up over, you know, uh, over the time uh, to about 3,500 people. So we were actually the largest humanitarian organization after the UN pulled out uh, pretty early. Um, uh, you know, they were, they were bombed and, and whatnot. So, in, in, in and this is this is during the war. What time period is this? This, this is, is uh, well, actually, there, there was a sort of a post-war period, right. uh, which was from say around April May of two thousand and three to when the civil war started, mm. which was uh, April of two thousand and four. I see. So I was, I you were kicked out. Up. You went back. You and then you come back. Yeah, I come. I yeah. came back almost immediately. Yeah. Um, you know, because Baghdad just lasted for another nine days or, or yeah. something like that before it fell, or five days or something, and then. And then I went back, and then I was running this humanitarian organization, and then the Civil War, and I built that up, and the Civil War started in April of 2004, and then I was still there, you know, for until the end of that year. Wow, and, and your partner and my, in this? Yeah, my co-founder of Jumpstart was Mohamed Al-Safar, who's an Iraqi, and he was, uh, he was assassinated. Um, because we used to, we were, we were just driving around all the time, uh, you know, just us uh, visiting all the projects. So we would have 80 projects at a time, um, you know, hospitals and, uh, you know, universities, and uh, we'd be cleaning up or, or taking down skyscrapers that were, were bombed or burned. Uh, and then just, uh, it was just a big manpower and engineering sort of effort to try to clean up the city and, and re, re, you know, we built a lot of housing, thousands of homes. And I mean, you must have seen some yeah. So like, you know, yeah. So, so uh, both during the war and you know, the Civil War is actually the wor worst part. If you think about American history, the Civil War is where more Americans have ever uh, have died. Yeah, I'm sure with many factors. Like half a million. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, you have, you'd have with battles the where population. there would be two hundred, yeah. two hundred fifty thousand or something like that yeah. would would die, yeah. versus. Uh, you know, in World War II, over six years or something, I think we lost a million people or, or less than that. Uh, you know, so so. The civil American Civil War is the, is the worst. In, the, in Iraq, it's the exact same thing. You know, with uh, when that started in April two thousand and four, all the way till recently, you know, it's uh, it's been the bloodiest sort of. Period. And y'all were inserting yourselves in kind of the, I mean, just where the, where yeah. there's carnage and where there's yeah. So like we would clean up after a terrorist bombing, you know, and there'd be body parts, and we we'd be I'd be stepping over body parts or stepping on them or or clean you know cleaning up. Uh, things a lot of my uh, workers would be injured 
Um, and I was just living in the, I wasn't living in the green zone, which is the American occupied or the, you know, coalition yeah. occupied so. territory. I was living in, you know, the, the red zone, the, the other area, the other parts of the city. So, um, so we would just go around all the time. I, I mean, I guess there's a question, you know, what, what was driving you to do? I, you, you I, was, I was frustrated, you know, I mean, what, what, what does any entrepreneur, you know, feel like, you know, when you see a market that's not being served, when you, when you, when you just like, this needs to happen, you know, like it's so stupid that it, the work wasn't getting done. But you didn't think, I mean, especially as a, you know, American or someone who looks European. Well, especially as American. But, but you know, not but, but being in the green zone, were you, you see, afraid? I mean, no, I mean, you could be a target, yeah, you could yeah. be abducted, so, you could so be... So sure, so sure, but you know, but there were Americans there risking their lives. They had suits and, you know, guns and whatnot. You know, but why shouldn't an American who's unarmed, you know, be out there risking their life, you know, for the same, uh, for the same cause, you know, to hopefully liberate the, the country and set them on their, their course and leave them alone. Um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, it, you know, I, I, I was in danger. Um, Were there a lot of folks like this? No, I mean, there, it, there weren't many. Yeah, because I mean, my impression, just through the news and whatever else, is that you had the green zone. That's yeah. where the civilian, the, yeah. the the Western civilians lived, and every now and then they might, with a huge military escort, kind of make an excursion outside of the the green zone. So, yeah. I mean, were there? Uh, now, there's actually USA Today called me at one point. I think it was around September, of 2004, and they said, "We think you're the last. We think you're the last one there." <laughs> and I said, "No, the Christian peacemaking team, who I kept in contact with, uh, they're still around." And then, then they got, you know, they're, but, they're, I mean, they you, got kidnapped and. And tortured, and some of them killed as well. So, like, it, there were there were not that many people, and most but, of them I mean, were. I, I mean, I'm just trying to, like, I I mean, it's admirable and it's amazing to kind of go in and do this stuff, and uh, but especially, you know, you're like the last one. Even the people who are turn know, off the lights when you when you, when right, you right, and they're getting abducted, getting tortured. Yeah. Getting, no, I, 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 mean, I did, had probably you, most of most of the people I knew probably got either kidnapped or. But I mean, in your mind, did you view this as a rational? <laughs> I mean, weren't you afraid? Weren't you, you know, there's being brave and then there's... Yeah, well actually what finally sent me from the country uh, in, when I did leave is because I thought that actually, and I, I'm not that, I'm not that, uh, you know, I'm not that uh, religious of a person, but uh, what finally sent me from the country is I was blinded in my left eye and I had cancer uh, and that, that, those two indicators. <laughs> if it was just the cancer by itself, <laughs> so I got I got skin cancer actually. And if you look closely, uh, they actually cut out an inch, uh, a two inch uh, patch, and it just kept getting worse. And I couldn't, uh, you know. And I and actually the the U.S. Uh, what was your family the US telling you? What is like, I mean, very good. Like, you know, they didn't even charge me anything to, I, well, to they dig it out. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then and then. Uh, and then I went blind in my left eye, and that was because I got some infection. And then the Iraqi doctor that I went to gave me a steroid, but it was a viral infection. And so a steroid on a virus, it makes it a super virus, and it basically ate my eye. And so it ate the skin off my eye, and I didn't have any skin on my eye. And uh, it was it was I, bad. Yeah, and, I, and at I, that point I said, you know, God is trying to give me a message. Right. Because in Irish, actually, O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan, means um, the one-eyed giant or something. So, so, uh, so there I was with one eye left, and and actually, amazingly, you know, I I got I got uh, treatment for it afterwards, and you know, they they take your blood and uh, they make some sort of special potion out of your blood, and it's it's and you can put it into your eye, and my eye grew back, and my vision got better than it, than it was before. So. So, so actually, my vision's now better than it was. Better was pre being eaten <laughs> so by a steroid induced <laughs> virus, eye eating virus. If you have eye trouble, I recommend going to Iraq. Uh, I set you up with this Iraqi doctor. <laughs> All right, that's I, yeah. I didn't, I actually, I, I didn't even. I mean, even, I didn't even know half of this stuff. I, I thought I'd done my back. This is mind blowing. Uh, yeah, I want to talk more. We, 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 anyway, we at, don't have a lot. At, at the end, of, at the end of it, I said, you know what? I'm getting enough messages here. I mean, everybody's telling me. I mean, freaking uh, NBC News followed me around for a day 
to do my obituary, you know. So like, uh, seriously? That, yeah, I didn't. They didn't tell me they like were the guy who obituary. wants to. Yeah, the guy who die. was doing it. No, 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 no. I didn't want to die. I, I didn't want to I die. Mean, it looks like someone who almost has a, you know, like no. the guy in World War One who always no, wants you know to be at the, the front. Like and... Americans had to do something. I know, it was very, 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 very yeah. frustrating to just go and do, 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 you know, to let the situation uh, be what it was. And I'm proud of America, actually. You know, I, I think Americans try to do the most incredible things um, for the planet. Their intent, what separates their intent and their execution sometimes is, is awful. You know, and, uh, you know, and everyone says, oh yeah, there was some ill intent in, in all this. And yeah, maybe a little bit, but it was mostly just misconceived in, 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 in my view. And so like to just let that go, you know, that was, it was speaking to my core that I needed to do something. And I was in a place to do something. I had some money, I actually gave, you know, I started, this, started it myself. And then I got some UN funding and some some, some other funding to, to keep it. And going. was your wife with you? Because she yeah she was a, well she's a war she was you know she she's a uh, she was a war reporter so wow. so she's uh, a little bit accustomed to it. But it was time for both of us to get out. So we we got married and then uh, and I was actually then I, I was working in the Gaza Strip. We built a, uh, a university uh, you know Gaza Polytechnic. Um, and uh, and I was on that trip, you know. We got married uh, on New Year's Eve, and nine months and seven days later, uh, Charlotte, our first daughter, was born. And so I think that's God's other signal uh, was that, uh, you know, I was not supposed to be in war zones anymore. Uh, so I, uh, you know, when I I was in the Gaza Strip, when I found out my wife was pregnant, and that was basically at the end of it, I I said, screw it, I'm not going to do this anymore. So. So I, I didn't, and now I've, I've, I've gone back and I throw myself at, at the technology. And technology, uh, and then you go back to Ireland. Why Ireland as opposed to? I was using my Irish passport when I was going in and around uh, in the green zone and you know, to get into the green zone and. Um, as opposed to your, why the Irish? As well, opposed to I, was, American passport? I was under the pretense that, that, uh, that Iraqi Arabic speakers couldn't tell the difference between uh, Irish uh, sounding accents and American sounding accents. Right. And actually, um, and it would just it would just be better if you were kind of abducted with an Irish passport yeah, versus an American absolutely. one. Or, or, yeah, absolutely. It would be better. The ad, ad, admission uh, fee to get in for a visa is like one tenth as much if you have your Irish passport huh. versus if you have a, your American passport. Yeah. It's a hundred dollars or something to get in wow. as an American or, or five dollars. And, and so then when you go back to Ireland, you, uh, I guess because you were using the passport, you started to feel, I, I guess you always kept some type of a joint citizenship or? Yeah, I had, uh, through, through my grandparents, I had, had Irish citizenship. So anyway, so I started a company in Ireland and, and now, you know, I live, the quality of life in Ireland is great. You know, uh, I, uh, you know, I love, it's, it's great being there and uh, we've just sort of started a, a company that I'm, I'm uh, a couple of companies that I'm, I'm minding. You started a couple of companies and even in your current SOS Ventures, y'all have backed some of the fairly well-known yeah. so Guitar Hero Oh yeah, guys. well, yeah. So yeah, Guitar Hero would have, would have been uh, a great win for us. There's, you know, I backed, uh, you know, pretty heavily a company called Netflix. Yes, yeah, so we've heard of it. Yes, yes. I've done, yeah, it's done well. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a number, like we, we have about 160 companies in the portfolio. Leap Motion was one of the ones I was just talking about, is a, a, a great big uh, one that we were the first uh, VC in on that as well. That's a recent one. But there's, you know, and so this week in San Francisco, we're actually launching 20 different companies. On Monday, we launched 10 from Hackcelerator, and today, later today, we're launching uh, the Leap Accelerator um, program in, uh, in San Francisco with 10 new companies. So, so, so we do a lot uh, and uh, I manage a, a couple hundred million dollar uh, fund and we, we believe in accelerating companies. You know, we're the accelerator VC. So we, we do a lot uh, to try to start as many good companies as we can because you know, ultimately you can, try to, you can try to go in and you can try to you know, change people's lives by you know, building a house or something like that. But if you can change, change their lives by, for example, enabling cloud computing or enabling you know, street mapping on computers or any of these new technologies that we're, that we're, we're launching, you know, these are really transforming tens of millions, or if not more, of people's lives. This is what I was speaking to you know, in terms of the, the disproportionate power that engineers have to 
impact you know the quality of life of mankind and we can you know that that's the most impact you can have as a person so even as a venture capitalist you know that's what i look to you know is this adding good to the planet to do this and what you're doing in, in Khan academy um you know it was a you know a five million dollar commitment that we made which is a, a reasonable size commitment huge for i mean it's 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 it continues to be one of our largest gifts ever uh, but especially at that f phase of the organization, it, it was yeah. a, it was a big deal for us. Well, thank you, but but you know I I feel honored that uh, you know to be a part of, of a part of your success because what you're doing is you know so transformative and potentially so transformative. We're, you're, I know you're only part of the way there, so none of you engineers need to rest on your laurels <laughs> <laughs> because there's a lot more a lot more that needs to be done. But um, uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, life is like that. You know, you try to get up every day and do something, you know, amazing um, and, uh, you know, try to make the world a better place. That's all, that's all the, the yeah. guiding philosophy is about. And, and I mean, what's been incredible, obviously, you, you help support us, but you've also uh, turned into something of an advisor and you've been driving some pretty neat initiatives in Ireland that we're actually hoping to eventually yeah, so Ireland's replicate. a little Petri dish, yeah. um, and we've got this thing called, going, I don't know if Sal or any of the gang has talked about it, called Mathletes. Um, and it's an experiment that we try, and it is super cool. It is just super cool. I was just looking over some of the stats this morning, and, uh, you know, we launched, we came up with this idea um, to, to try to duplicate the, the passion that people have about athletics um, and the pride uh, that people have about their school or their, their, their you know, individual performance, trying to have people be uh, de as dedicated to their schools through athletics as they would to athletics. And, and this is something that, you know, it seems like it's working, you know, it's early days, but uh, in uh, just the age range that we're talking about, uh, from 11 to 15, um, the, evidently, by running this Mathletes competition over two and a half months, the, the web traffic for Khan Academy is something like three and a half times as many. For all of Ireland. For all of Ireland. And y'all were essentially just getting started these last yeah. few months. Yeah, and so it's, we launched the idea, you know, one and a half percent of all the kids in Ireland in that age range are now competing in, in, in Mathletes. Um, if you did that across the United States, I think it would be like 70,000 70, schools yeah. would be competing. We, uh, and it's competing at a, you know, with, uh, at a very, very, very significant level. Like they're, they're the top 1% of kids in the last two and a half months have spent, I don't know, we just looked at the stats. Was it was 20-something 20, 20 hundred 2700 minutes. or something like that. Yeah, so minutes you know, of study. They, they, several in grade two months, levels. In just two months. In just several two grade months. levels of math, yeah. you know, in just two and a half months. Now that's the top 1%. But if you take it to the top 5% or top 10%, yeah. they've done several grade levels of, of math in, in, you know, with the 700 minutes or 580 minutes. Or, and it's really turned into a national thing, the yeah. prime minister's yeah, well, so the, the Antishuk, which is the, the Irish for uh, the prime minister, it's a ministerial form of government rather than pre the president in Ireland doesn't, uh, is, a, is not the same as the president here. So, so the Antishuk is the head of the government. And um, so he's given away the Mathletes prizes. We have little trophies that he gives, uh, that have been given to the schools for their uh, competition. It started in February, um, the final, the finals, and it's and it works out like you know, like the NCAA's sort of thing, where there's a whole you know uh, press coverage and there's leaderboards that go out every week. People know where their schools are on the leaderboards on a county level, on a regional level, and on a, on a national level. And so there's a tremendous amount of pride that people are taking in their accomplishments and the accomplishments of their school, and the teachers are getting sucked into this because they're passionate about it and because they're because it's exciting and because the kids are excited and so it's potentially a really 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 interesting way of you know we, we've seen that um you know something like 350 percent uh you know the number of the number of people that are participating in ireland is only doubled even though it's just this age age range but the on Khan Academy now, but the 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 engagement is like four times. Um, so 
so the, the number of page views and the number of time. So if, if we can duplicate that for the world, you know, yeah. or for the United States, uh, then you're talking about a lot of impact. Yeah. And we're, I'm, I'm super excited about this. And another thing I'm excited about is there's been this fallacy that women aren't good at math. And uh, this proves, you know, we, we've got an exactly 50-50, you know, uh, gender split uh, for the top performing uh, athletes in the, in, the, uh, in the country. And then even at the national competition, which is taking place next Saturday, um, this, there is a slight discrepancy, but we don't know if there's gender bias in, the, in how parents, we don't know, we, we have to look at the data a little bit more, but it's still incredibly similar. It's 54% to 46% uh, boys to girls at the, at the national level, which when you think about your day, Sal, when you were in math competitions, how many women were in the competitions versus men? There weren't many. There were uh, yes. Yeah, it's there, like there it's were, like it's it was, like an engineering yeah. school, one in ten or one in right. one in six or something. Right. You know, it's 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 awful. So we we need to, you know, they, as they say, women hold up half the sky. So yeah. you know, we have to uh, we have to use all of our talent, all of our people, to to advance the planet. And more women should become, you know, more more technically capable. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I could go on for hours because actually on Egypt, I'm actually have a million questions about Iraq as well. But anyway, I mean, thank you so much. This was a, a bigger treat than I even expected. The more I got to even know you, who I've known for three years, but uh, the more of your background, uh, my respect for you has gone you know, to, to even a whole other level. And uh, so thank you for being an early supporter and, and continuing to do incredible things and pushing us into the direction, frankly, we should be going in, which is getting more community building and more people to kind of really feel invested in, in yeah. learning. Yeah, we're all, we're all learning here and so uh, you know each day is a each day is a joy if we just take it that way we don't know what's what the future is we can't predict what the future is but we can we can measure we can go in a lean way and we can adapt our course on the way and hopefully some of the learnings we're doing in our little petri dish in Ireland can apply to, to uh, the overall mission which I love about what Khan Academy is doing so great thank but you thanks so much Sam. thank you